On February 2020, a group of students at the Swiss University ETH Zurich launched the second version of their two-wheeled robot. Ascento, as they call it, is totally able to balance itself using only two wheels. And this makes it capable of performing many interesting maneuvers with a very small footprint. In addition to its impressive ability to jump up and down the stairs and to recover from those jumps without falling. So, in order to gain some insights on some of the techniques used by this robot, we will build a 3D model of a two wheeled self balancing robot in Simulink. And we will use the PID controller to achieve an upright pose like we saw with Ascento. So before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. It's absolutely free and you can always change your mind. So that being said, let's begin. The idea behind building these type of vehicles come from the basic pendulum. A weight suspended by a piece of rope. When a pendulum is displayed sideways from its equilibrium position, it is subject to gravity that will accelerate it back towards the equilibrium position. When released, the gravity action on the pendulum's mass will cause it to oscillate back and forth until it stops moving eventually due to the friction. If we rotated this configuration upside down and replaced the rope with a solid rod, then we have an inverted pendulum. Our objective in this case is to force the mass to stay in an upright pose and that requires a constant movement from the base governed by a control system. If we replaced the base with two wheels and the rod and mass with this chassis, then we have built ourselves a self-balancing robot. Building this in Simulink does not require much skill or effort. We will begin by opening a new project by typing the command simnew in the command window. This will open a Simscape multi-body model template equipped with the essential parts you need to begin. On the right, you can see three blocks on top of each other, which are the solver, responsible for performing calculations, the world frame, that is considered to be the ground of every mechanical model in Simulink, and it gives access to the world coordinate frame and the mechanism configuration where we can specify a uniform gravity for the entire mechanism. First of all, we need to build wheels for our robot. So we open the Simulink library and head down to Simscape and open multibody, then body elements. In here we will find our first building blocks. We will grab the cylinder and drag and release into Simulink window. If you double click the cylinder uh, window will open, in here we will specify the dimensions of our wheels. The datasheet of these wheels I found on Amazon says it's 32.5 mm in radius and 12.5 mm in thickness. We choose the black color for the tire. And set the mass to 50 grams. Uh, and for the interior of the wheel, we will begin by these measurements and we will set the color to be yellow as in real life. Now we can make our lives easier by visualizing our work. This is done by connecting our wheels and tire to the world frame block on the left. Now, if you run the project or you hit Ctrl D, the Mechanics Explorer will appear above the command window. Now we can see the model, and of course the tire and the wheels are the same radius, so we can distinguish them from each other. That's why we should give the interior a smaller radius and slightly bigger height. This will make it clearly visible as we can see in the screen. We select the components of the model now and group them into a subsystem to simplify the look of this block diagram. And finally, I'll distribute the mass of 50 grams between the wheel and the tire and we just copy and paste to create the other wheel. 
Now it's time for building the upper body of the robot or the pendulum as found in the literature. It contains three rectangular planes attached together using four rods. We begin by making a rectangular plane using the brick solid block and we specify an 18 by 8 by 0.3 centimeters as our dimension and the color of our choice. I chose this color with the 60% opacity. I think it looks really nice this way. And finally, we set the weight to one fourth of a kilogram and we close the window. We then duplicate this shape to make three shelves. The next step is creating the rods. We will do this by importing a cylinder block and make it exactly 25 centimeters long and 5 millimeters in radius. And we set the weight to 1 sixteenth of a kilogram. Then we duplicate it to make our rods. The assembly of these parts requires the rigid transform block. Basically, what this block does is to transform one solid block with respect to another solid block and they will stay that way during the simulation. And if they move, they move as a one unit because their pose with respect to each other is constrained. This block is very useful in using simple solid blocks to build compound bodies as we are about to do right now. We connect the chassis part 1 with chassis part 2 through a rigid transform that will move the chassis part 2 by a 10 cm in the Z axis with the respect to chassis part 1. Next, we will create a rigid transform between chassis part 1 and 3 this time, but with a distance of 25 cm. So both of chassis 2 and 3 are connected to 1 now. With chassis 1 is the base frame and the others are the followers. Now we will follow a similar procedure to attach the pillars. We connect rod 1 at first. Their centers seem to be located at the same place. So we have to move rod 1 in the X axis and then in the Y axis to be located at the top right corner. It is done like this. We choose a Cartesian translation by half of the rectangle width in the x-axis minus 1 cm and by half of the rectangle height in the y-axis also minus 1 cm and by 25 over 2 in the z-axis and we do the same for the other pillars or rods as you say and place them in the remaining corners by transforming them this way. And finally, we group our chassis in a subsystem. Now cast all this aside and turn our attention to the wheels. They need the shaft. So we use a rectangle solid block, but beware, from now on, given extra attention to the axis of our objects. So we make our view convention to Y up. This will make it easier to work with the joints later. Now we give it a dimension of 1 by 1 by 20 centimeters and the weight of 100 grams. 
and we connect it to the wheels This will put their centers together. So we need the rigid transform to translate each wheel to one end of the shaft by specifying the following translations. And then we group all of them in the subsystem and we call it cart. Since the x axis is our vertical axis in this project, the gravity will have to be pointed in the minus x direction, as we specify in the mechanism configuration block in here. Now it's time to put together the chassis and the cart, so we connect the cart to the world frame and to the chassis through a rigid transform performing a sequence of rotations. Ninety degrees rotation around the y axis and one eighty around the x axis. Make sure the rotation is set to yxz sequence and the translation will be one centimeter in the x axis to put the shaft exactly under the body. Now the chassis and the cart should be related by a revolute joint that will give a degree of freedom to the motion and this will allow the chassis to swing like a pendulum. Now there is still an important step which is to create a prismatic joint between the cart and the world frame. This will allow it to move back and forth and eventually stabilizing the body in an upright pose given by the appropriate controller. And don't forget to set rotation before this joint, turning our robot to face the positive Z direction. I'll apply an external force on the robot in this point which as you can clearly see makes it fall and swing like a normal pendulum. All we have left to do now is to provide the right input to the prismatic joint in order to achieve the desired behavior from this system. For calculating the right input, we need a control loop. This control constitutes mainly from three parts. The first one is our system, and from it we will measure the inclination angle theta. The second part in this control loop is the summation process, where we are going to compare theta with the desired output which is zero degrees, and we feed this error to the third part of this loop, and that is the PID controller which will give us the appropriate force to be applied in order to stabilize the robot. Ok, now we will begin by reading the angle of inclination of the chassis, provided by the position of the revolute joint. We will also set the force in the prismatic joint to be provided by input, and the motion to be automatically computed for obvious reasons. The angle is in radians. So maybe you want to convert it to degrees to get more readable information. This is done by multiplying by 180 over pi. The minus sign here is a result of the comparison operation we talked about earlier. And after this, we just import the PID block and some conversion blocks. Because the physical system represented by the robot body and the joints is considered to be separate from the other simulink blocks. And to connect them, we need these two blocks. In the simulink to physical block, we set the unit of the input signal as Newton. And we set the filtering parameters as you can see in here.
We set the units of the other block to radians since the revolute joint give us the angle in radians or you can just leave it to inherit automatically from the previous block. We also import a couple of scope blocks and we are set to go. The last phase is the tuning. The PID parameters must be tuned to give us the desired behavior. So we will remove the external forces that we applied earlier and we import this step block. I want to give an initial inclination to the robot instead of applying an external force. Uh, so we will sum the output signal with the step signal that is going to be just 10 degrees for 0 0.01 seconds. This should give us what we seek. We go ahead now and open the PID block. The main parameters to consider here is these three. The proportional, the integral and the derivative gains. Each one of these have an effect on the observed response of the system. We will learn these effects by practice. So let's set the proportional gain to 2 and the other to 0. We already can see that our system is stabilized, however, not forever. The oscillations keep increasing and the robot will fall eventually. We can reduce the oscillation a little bit by increasing the derivative gain, so let's set it to 0.01. As expected, the oscillations are reduced and the system is stable as the inclination angle measurements are indicating. However, the robot is still moving, seems indefinitely to the left. This is called the steady state error and we can manage it by increasing the integral gain a little bit. However, beware, the integral gain and the proportional gain reduce the rise time, in other words, make the system faster and as a consequence increase the oscillations. So we may observe this effect now. And of course the oscillation is increased a little bit, but the steady state error is far more less now, uh, thanks to the integral gain. And increasing it even more will keep the robot almost in place. That was the manual tuning method, and in Simulink you have another option. It is known as the auto-tune. We can set the desirable attributes of our response, and the auto-tuner will generate the appropriate PID gains, which give us more control over the robot. Like Asento, a robot now is balancing on just two wheels, earning the name of a self-balancing robot. You can go further and enhance the PID parameters and get a better performance than I did. So don't forget to share with me your results. All I have to tell you now is, as always, stay safe and see you in another video with another idea.